Um, so I am, uh, as, I said, as Lucy just said, a senior lecturer at QCA in Bris uh, Brisbane. I'm also, in that capacity, I'm coming out of a career as an artist and designer in the US. So my terminal degree in the US is an MFA. I'm also currently getting a PhD at Griffith in museum studies, so moving sort of closer into the institutional back end of this field. Um, my uh, previous work has been around uh, largely artistic or design installations working with museums or independently on um, activating and making affective local history for local audiences. Right now what I'm working on through uh, the State Library in uh, Queensland is um, working more with the catalog, with the archive of the um, John Oxley collection there, and working on the back end to make those existing materials and any future materials they might collect um, more accessible, uh, more described, and more um, usable by a wider variety of Queensland audiences. Uh, so the Middle House of Scholar Scholarship in Residence was founded just a couple of years ago to develop new ideas, tools, and strategies, and services to benefit GLAM and the State Library of Queensland. So no pressure. Um, I was, uh, I'm, I'm uh, the, the phrase that I cut describes me as a thought leader, which I thought I would cut because I hate that phrase, but I do have thoughts. So um, what I'm going to do in this talk is just sort of speed walk through a sort of conceptual framework or why this seemed to me to be an interesting research area and why I think the catalog as I've encountered it as an independent, research, independent researcher um, can benefit from some redesign in, the, in accessibility and in description. Um, so when I was applying for the Middle Hauser, I um, of course talked to a bunch of people there and Robin Hamilton, who's the lead of collection building, in other words, acquisitions, um, said something that has been st stuck with me. Basically, I've thought about this every day since. Um, the collection is only as accessible as the way we describe it. Um, the John Oxley uh, collection at SLQ um, funds several different fellowships, some of whom like me, are working on sort of the back-end strategies and, and um, concerns, some of whom are researching historical stories to find what materials are in the John Oxley collection and bring those forward to the public. Um, and what the SLQ um, staff, curators and, and archivists often say is, we want you to tell us what's in our collection. Um, because often all they know is the tiny bits of metadata that came with whatever acquisition details they have. Nobody's looked in these boxes for 50 years in some cases. They want to know, they want interested and educated people to find out what's there and make not just the materials, but the descriptions of the materials more effective. So again, just gonna sort of speed walk through um, the uh, base concerns that I think most or everybody in the world is, uh, in the room is aware of. Um, creating a, a museum experience or a front-end experience that, that includes more affect um, as well as information to create a, an interface for objects so that um, the, the context between the public, between the viewer and the object itself has its own immediate uh, vibrancy in life. Uh, affect at its most basic can be described primarily in, in sound culture as the way that two bodies interact with each other. Specifically in sound, a sound is generated from one object and that literally vibrates you. It vibrates in your ear or even in your clothing if it's loud enough. Um, so an affect is the physical effect that an object or an environment has on you. Um, and so what we uh, see in museums often is objects that for very good reasons are cut off, are decontextualized, not only from their source, but from the viewer. Um, you're not allowed to touch or interact with objects for their own good, but that also means that you're cut off um, quite, a, quite a bit from what makes that object an object, from its tactility, from its weight, from its texture. Um, so one question is how can this affect uh, be reinvigorated in the experience of objects in a collection. Thinking not just about sound, but about any object. Um, for my own purposes, thinking about uh, affect, which is an intensely personal, physical, individual phenomenon, a first question is how does affect work when you're thinking about events that you weren't there for? This isn't a sense memory that I have of my childhood. This is me looking at an object that predates my birth, something that speaks to a history that, that I inherit, but that I'm not literally uh, physically a part of. Um, and the, the concept that I use there is Husinger's historical sensation. Husinger was a Dutch um, 
sociologist who worked on that feeling that we have when we encounter an object of duration, an object that's been there for, let's say, thousands of years, or even just hundreds, um, and that we suddenly realize, my gosh, this object has been there. This object has existed through all the periods between that time that I've read about and mine. Um, that, that it's like a dipstick traveling through time, connecting me physically to a place and a time in the past. Um, I'll try to go on, on as few tangents as possible, but this is an important one. My parents are archaeologists, um, which is how I come by this, specifically Near Eastern archaeologists. So um, my mother spent a lot of her career traveling around the world reading cuneiform tablets, which I thought was intensely boring. Um, but once I was holding a tablet that she was like, I picked it up and looked at it, and I realized that there was a thumbprint on the side of it, which is not, you don't usually look at, you know, like you don't see photos of the sides of an object, but there was a thumbprint where, right where my thumb was, and I thought what, what, that 3,500 years ago, somebody held this just like I'm holding it, like another human being occupied the same space around this object that I'm holding it now. And that was an intensely powerful moment for me. Um, that, that thing became, as another Dutch sociologist, Runia said, alarmingly present. So, um, this is thinking about objects not just as um, bodies of information about the past, but of as relics that um, negotiate affect transactions, that create some kind of living awareness of the past. How is it possible to do this in an archival setting? Um, in other words, objects, and I would say this not quite as a definition, but objects have the capacity not just to articulate meaning, but to embody it. And so the, the um, issue becomes how do we mediate and provide access to that object in a productive way to create that sense of affect. In particular, in a lot of collections, objects are tangible echoes of the past, but we can't touch them. Um, this is an image from a show at Queensland Museum in 2016 um, called This Is My Heritage, in which um, indigenous Queensland artists were invited as investigators into the Queensland Museum's archives of objects, of indigenous objects, to find one that spoke to them and to then speak about it, to tell the story of what this meant to them, what memories or knowledge or history um, derived from them for them out of this object. This is Shanoa uh, Dimal holding a fire stick and talking about the intense sense memories that it gives her of her childhood, of s the smell of sitting around the fire, of talking with her grandfather, or her grandfather teaching her to make fire sticks. Um, and it's a very effective story, but another effective thing for me just about this image is of course the white gloves. Um, because she's not allowed to touch this object that is giving her such, Im such sense, uh, intense sense memories. Um, so what we often say is that these objects are representing the past. So they're um, serving a certain imaginative uh, function and our function in museums is to uh, find a way to activate the imagination, even the physical imagination, the affective imagination that can come across with these images um, and there is both a um, promise and a danger in dig using digital tools to do this. This is uh, Plymouth Rock, or in theory, it's a part of Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock is one of America's uh, founding mythical objects. Um, it's where the pilgrims supposedly landed in the 17th century. Um, there are lots of questions around whether every piece of rock that claims to be from Plymouth Rock is a piece of Plymouth Rock. It would be the size of Manhattan if that were true. Did the pilgrims actually land there? Nobody mentioned it for about 50 years later, until about 50 years later, et cetera, et cetera. But you look at this rock and you think, oh, Plymouth Rock, this is America right here. This is a tangible, that I can't touch, but it's a tangible section of America's founding myth. Um, and digital technology, on the face of it at least, and we all know this stuff, I hope, um, allows us more and greater interactions through a more apparently accessible sort of um, uh, mediation. So this is a high-res 3D scan done by the British Museum of the Rosetta Stone so that anybody can look at it and rotate it around. You can, as I did with that cuneiform tablet, look at the side and look at the back. You can see lots of different aspects of the Rosetta Stone that like even most people don't have access to the front of the Rosetta Stone except in maybe a bad print illustration from a t childhood textbook. Now you can see the back, you can see the sides, you can see, well, you can't really see the bottom because um, there's some digital damage there that happened with the, the scanning technique. Um, so on the one hand, this seems like a very powerful access tool. You can zoom right in and see 
to the texture up to a point. On the other hand, and this is the criticism, of course, of digital reproduction and digital accessibility, um, you're still not touching it, right? And the materiality that you're seeing here is the digital materiality. The digital materiality has its own nature, its own sense, and so what I'm seeing here is like this stuff. What I'm seeing here is where the sides don't quite match up and you get this kind of very digital 3D landscape-y sort of effect. Um, so on the one hand, a powerful access tool, but on the other hand, um, creates its own interface, creates its own blockage between the artifact and the person. Uh, so not as transparent as previous, um, or as some evangelicals, digital ev evangelicals would like to claim. Um, so how can we navigate these digital tools in a way that's productively um, creating affect? Uh, one group of people or one set of um, investigators who have tr tried to, to hammer on this are um, contemporary artists, in particular installation artists, who have been reacting to what Hal Foster, the art critic, calls the archival impulse. Um, the impulse in a lot of contemporary artists to look at archives, to use archived materials and collections as their material, um, and not just to make work that reacts to that material, like painting a historical figure, but making work out of the archive. Um, uh, like just literally posting investigative materials on the walls of the gallery. You'll see this kind of strategy more and more. Um, so there's a, there's a big uh, move now in contemporary art to take the archive, to take our, our intense uh, feeling that more and more information around us is archived and collected and is available in large data sets and to figure out what to do with that. How can we make all of that information creative and interpretable in an art context? Um, part of what I'm wondering is, can we take a look at those um, strategies that I, for instance, have been working with in the past few years and return them to the archive and say, is there a way to, to take some of these strategies and move them back into um, working specifically with the archive? Um, I'll leave Baroque alone for a minute. But what strategies, in other words, can make the edges of the archive more porous? Um, without damaging objects or without damaging the things that are, that are there in the archive, how can we make those objects at least somewhat more um, accessible and more affective? Now, I haven't talked about sound yet, which is the um, basis of my research. Um, and that's partly because sound is a relatively new um, concern of mine. I got into sound because it seemed like a very pragmatically useful way to think about history, to think about what we can access about the past and what we can't access about the past. Sound is an immediate affective memory trigger. Um, everybody has had the experience of hearing something, or better yet, of smelling something, um, and being suddenly transported back to the past. It doesn't just remind you of the past, it seems to erase that boundary between you and the past and casts you into a, a memory. Um, at the same time, sound is one of the least accessible things in the, about the past because it literally does not last. Um, a sound is created, reverberates in the air for a little while, and then unless it's recorded, vanishes. It's gone again. Um, even if it is recorded, then what you've got is a recording of a sound which is removed from its original auditory place, from its original space, and so forth. Um, so sound seemed to me to be a very interesting material, both as that immediate physical connection to a past experience and as a reminder of everything that's gone about the past, everything that we can't access, the, the immediate physical feeling of what the past was like. Um, uh, for instance, one uh, sociologist uh, des describes the sound, or describes people describing the sound of patterns Patterns were the large platforms that women used to wear on their shoes in the 18th century so that they, when they were walking through muddy streets, to keep their shoes out of the mud. For whatever reason, you know, like long, big platforms like this, for whatever reason, British women wore uh, platens out of metal. So they made this ungodly clattering sound as women, as upper class women were sort of walking around the streets of London, which all foreign visitors mentioned. Like it was, it was sort of one of the sens sensory, um, uh, associations with London was the sound of clattering women sort of tottering around on these large platforms made of metal and making this strange clanging noise. Um, that's completely gone now. 
you know, we can hear people describing it, but we have no idea what that actually sounded like, what London in that sense meant to people. Um, so on the one hand, sound is completely violating of boundaries. We can't block it out. Um, you, <laughs> you all there, you can look away at your phones, but you can't just, you know, decide to stop hearing me. Um, I'm, I'm constantly present in your ear. Um, and then on the other hand, that sound does fade away eventually. Um, now, what I'm primarily interested in then is the sound of everyday life, the sound that objects make, the sound that rooms make when we're in them, the sounds that, that the outdoors make. Um, and this is not largely the way that sound has been recorded throughout the history of recorded sound and the way it's treated in archives. Usually it's treated either diegetically in historical reconstruction, and we all know those, you know, just sort of like often foleying or using sound effects to reconstruct an, an, an understanding of how the past sounded, or linguistic in the sense of oral histories, um, performances, etc. What I was curious about in, in coming to the, the State Library, the John Oxley collection, was thinking about um, a sound experience as historical material in itself. Sound as, the sounds of the past as objects almost in a curatorial sense. Can we understand them? Can we um, experience them? And can we learn from them in that way? Um, just to step very quickly through a couple of, very quickly, through a couple of, um, this very quickly because my sound seems not to be working now. Oh well. Oh, there it is. Can you hear that? Just barely. Um, this is one of my inspirations was an old project from the US called the American Dialect Recording Project um, in which uh, people went around recording people reading things not, not talking, not sit, telling stories, not doing anything, just often they chose what to read, but sometimes they didn't choose what to read, just had them read a particular thing. So you can just barely hear that, but this is a woman um, in the 1960s, I think, um, from Charleston, South Carolina, so low country Carolinas, speaking in a way that is immediately recognizable to anybody who's ever been to the Carolinas. Um, and I should, I guess I should say at this point, uh, there are many, many more regional accents in the US than in almost any other English speaking country, except possibly Britain, because that's where it all started, um, in terms of English. Uh, so um, there, you know, like I used to work in, in North Carolina and there were people from the west of the state who would make fun of the accent of people from the east of the state. Um, it's that, it can be that regional. And so this is a sense in which culture is born not by what people say, culture is born not by what um, the stories that they have or their, their biographies, culture is born literally by how they sound, what their language sounds like. And if I do have time, I wanna mention briefly that idea of the sound of language. Um, how, what soundscapes are like in, in different countries and different, and, and, ba and I'll just mention briefly now, um, very, in a very heightened way because this is the year of indigenous languages internationally, um, which languages count as part and get to be part of the soundscape of a particular place. Um, so there, there are two different kinds of basically the ways that sounds, historical sounds get represented. And I um, will mention them both very briefly. One is that affective, um, almost traumatic memory um, where a, a sound that you hear reminds you of a sound that you um, have heard so, in, uh, so physically and so immediately that it transports you back to that time. The, um, most obvious example is examples of trauma, like World War II air raid sirens, and this is something that actually was true of my grandmother, who is Dutch. Um, she lived through World War II in the, in the Netherlands, and decades later, after she'd moved to the US, she heard one siren one time in, I think, the 70s that sounded exactly like an air raid siren, and the next thing she knew, she had dived under a table. Um, she just could not, like her body could not differentiate between the present time and the past time. So that immediate sense of not just of memory, but of breaking down the barriers of time. Um, but we also, of course, often don't have, like she couldn't have, like she couldn't literally reproduce that sound for me. Um, what she did was describe it. 
and this is often also a way that we describe the past to each other is by describing sounds, by acting them out for each other, um, by doing or or what making that whatever that sound is with our voices. And this, as I've gone along, this has become, if anything, the most interesting part of this uh, sound exploration. I started out thinking, okay, what sounds does a library have? I became much more interested in, okay, what sounds do people talk about when they're talking about the past? And I'll go into that in a bit. Um, well, I'll go into it right now, in fact. Uh, so what I've done is um, I'm going through all of this John Oxley's audiovisual materials. Uh, something that happens when you go through their audiovisual materials is that you'll do a search through one search, their Dotty public search engine. Um, I've searched for work audio, um, because I'm interested in the sound of work. Audiovisual materials in the John Oxley collection and you know, musicals come up, Keith Urban songs come up. Every once in a while, a piece of historical stuff will come up. Um, and it's really up to the vagaries of time whether sound is mentioned in the description at all, whether it says that it has sound. It'll say 16 millimeter, in which case it doesn't have sound because 16 millimeter doesn't bear sound. Oh, actually, 8 millimeter doesn't bear sound. 16 millimeter might. 35 millimeter usually does. If you don't know that, I was a filmmaker long ago. If you don't happen to know that, then you're just like, well, it could have sound. It might not. It's in a box somewhere in the building. Um, I could request, request it and also request their ancient projector. Somebody will have to blow off dust off of it and you know, I'll have to have somebody sit there and wind up the projector and, and make it work. Um, so what I found was that a lot of the sound was opaque behind these one-line descriptions. So it was impossible to get at whether those field sounds were there or not. Um, so I created what I thought I would do when I started this um, fellowship in June was to start doing an audit of all of their audiovisual materials, all of their sounds, listen to a bunch of stuff and say, okay, this is what this sound has, this is, what, this is the sound that this film has, these are the sounds that you can hear, and, and so forth. What I ended up doing first was to build myself some software tools to be able to do this. And this is where the nature of the Middlehauser comes in. Really, it's about um, creating methodologies and strategies for other people to work. Um, rather than working with one search itself, which has its limitations, um, you can tag and uh, um, things yourself. Um, this allows me to split off my own collection, do some searches, and something that I'm, I don't know if any non-researchers will ever um, think this is as cool as I do, but when you do a search, it highlights for me the results, but also keeps showing the non-results. Um, which is important in the sense of like all of you, scraping all of this metadata because um, sometimes there are edge cases that don't get caught in the basic search that you've done. So I like to see the non-results as well as the results. Having um, isolated these results, I'm now creating a database where I'm going through, this is a video made by Gary Maloney in the 1990s about his hometown, Palin Creek, um, about an hour southwest of Brisbane and identifying basically all of the sounds of different kinds. Um, and I've created a demo, which you also will not be able to hear. But this is, a, this is the more sort of back-end interface where I'm saying, okay, here's where the sound is, here's what it is. This is um, just playing all of those sounds in order. Um, I'm, I went on too long. But the point that I want to make is that um, Gary Maloney made this in documentary in the 90s about his home, about where he lived, and about the ways that it was changing. Um, and he talks a lot during it. What I've done is cut out all of the interviews, all of the um, him talking, and focus just on the field recording of the sounds as he decided what to play and what to include. Um, and this actually becomes very revealing, I think, to me. Um, uh, it becomes revealing because of its context. And this is uh, um, an important uh, concept in how to label and record sound. Um, I'm identifying what the, what the area of sound is, what the field recording actually is, and the narrative context that makes that interesting. And I'm able to do this because I'm working from a documentary in this case. Um, uh, the red cedars used to cover the, the hills around this point. The lumber industry moved in, cut them all down. The lumber industry was a boom um, industry for about a generation, maybe two, and then all the red cedars were dead. So the lumber industry moved away again. Um, so this is 
both footage and the sound of the lone red cedar left in the Palin Creek area. They don't grow anymore because of a parasite, um, a bug that sort of makes them very difficult to maintain. Um, so this, to me, is one example of a sound that is, it's the sound of Gary Maloney remembering. It's the sound of him remembering his childhood, the things that he wanted to show us about his childhood home. It's also um, the sound of what was missing even then. This, like the sound of the, the red cedars covering the hills is inherently different from the sound of uh, um, the single red cedar sitting in open plains. And this um, brings up the last important point. <laughs> The very, very last important point, which is that um, I talked about both recorded sound um, that was recorded on site and described sound, the way that people describe sound after the fact. Uh, there's also a sense of missing sound, Mi uh, the sound that isn't there in, for instance, silent film, and that um, we can only, or that I can only guess at what it was like. And this, my hope for future um, uh, rounds of this particular tool is that we move first from me building the tool in order to see essentially I'm making a research tool by doing the research that the research tool is required to do and seeing what about the research is required for the tool and then I build the tool in, in reaction. After that, I want to work with specific researchers and say, okay, can we, can we find things, stories to work on? And after that, I want to open it up to the public and say, okay, how can we start to fill in these descriptions? How can we open it up to the public and say, for instance, as in one of um, the State Library's other projects, what can you tell us about this? What are the stories? What are the tags? What can you tell us about the sound? Do you, in particular, as an individual, recognize this place? And what are the sounds that you can tell us about? Um, okay. And that's it. <laughs>